reading today comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 7 through 14, and then verses 17 through 18. This is uh, Moses' sermon to the people of Israel before they enter the promised land. They've been in the wilderness 40 years, and now before they get to go into the promised land, they hear these words of God from Moses. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land flowing with streams, with springs and underground waters, welling up in valleys and in hills. A land of wheat and barley and vines and figs and pomegranates. A land of olive trees and honey. A land where you may eat bread without scarcity. Where you will lack for nothing. A land whose stones are iron and from the hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. When you have eaten your fill and have built the houses to live in them, and when your head curves and flocks have multiplied, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then do not exalt yourself. Forgetting the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me here. But remember the Lord your God. May God add his blessing in the reading of this word. I suppose it's the time of the year, but I've been reading a lot about gratitude lately. And how gratitude and the practice of gratitude is important. How if we practice gratitude, we make it a point in our lives, in every day that we spend to be grateful, how it can have such a positive effect on us. In fact, I read one article recently that says those who practice gratitude every day, gratitude, they practice gratitude, are 25% happier. Okay, I'm not sure what 25% happier means or how that feels, but let me tell you, I do buy this. I think it is important to be grateful. I think being grateful does make us happier, and practicing gratitude makes us happier, makes us more contented. And further, I'll go on to say that I believe that Practicing gratitude in our lives will help us to feel closer to God. I also buy what's the assumption that's behind all this, which is we are not naturally good at gratitude. It is something we have to work on. It is something that we have to make a point to do. So another article I was reading had 20 or so different gratitude exercises that you could do. And some of them were good and some of them were bad. And I'd like to sprinkle here in my comments today some of both. Gratitude exercises. And who knows, you may find one here that resonates with you, that you want to do every day and then you'll be 25% happier. And that would be good. Well, here's one right off the bat. And it's for those of us, especially good for those of us, who will be spending Thanksgiving with a group, with our family, with our friends. It's a... Uh, it's called the gratitude chair, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, got, it's good. Just remember, I got it off the internet, so it's got to be good. <laughs> and here's what you do. You make one chair in your house, the gratitude chair, and everybody has a chance to sit in that chair. And when they're sitting there, you say, everybody there has to say one thing that they are grateful about regarding that person. I don't know about this one. I can just see this, uh, how this would go over in my family. I think it would turn into more of a, a celebrity roast. I think everybody would try to be kind of outdoing each other uh, on saying funny things. I can just imagine sitting down and having my brother say, I'm, I'm grateful that David left some pie this year for the rest of us. Or I'm grateful David's prayer was shorter this year than it was last year. Well, maybe this isn't the one for us. Maybe this is exercise, but it is a reminder to us that there are ways that we can practice gratitude in our lives. And we read in our scripture reading today, 
And we need that. It is a part of our nature to forget to be grateful. Once again, the Hebrew people are standing on the edge of the promised land. They've been in the, in the wilderness for 40 years, and I know they're stomping at the beds to get there, to actually get to this place they've been hearing and dreaming about for so long. And Moses said, okay, we're about to go in, but first you have to listen to the sermon. Okay, well, listen to the sermon. So here's the sermon, and boy, what words God gives to Moses. I, I love this, because it says so much about us, and it's so true what it says. God says to the people through Moses, this land I'm about to give you is a wonderful land. It is a land of milk and honey. There's iron, there's copper, there's water welling up from everywhere. There are pomegranates to eat and other great fruits and fig trees and olives. It is a wonderful place. You are going to be happy there. You are going to thrive in this location. But remember, when your houses are all built and the crops are all sown in the field, and you have this abundance. It's coming into your life, and you're, you're feeling it and seeing it every day. All that you have in your wealth is growing. Do not say, it is my power, and it is by the might of my hand that I have gotten here. But instead, remember the Lord your God. I think this verse is incredible. It's, it's God saying and showing how well he knows us as his people. He knows us so well. He's like the parent who can tell the kids are up to something before they actually get up to something. And can warn them about it. And that is just what he does for the Hebrew people and he's doing for us today. Warning us not to forget to be grateful. Because it doesn't always come naturally for us. Oh, we may start out grateful. We get something new. We're in some new relationship. Something brand new and shiny in our lives. And yes, we're grateful for it. But then what happens? Time goes on. We begin to take it for granted. And even more so, we start to feel entitled. Like it is owed to us that we have this thing in our lives. Friends, entitlement is one of the great enemies to gratitude. The feeling that we are owed this thing. Well, let me give you another exercise. That you can do. This is one I like much better. And it's a great way to fight the sense of entitlement, I think. And it's great for those of us who already like to go out and walk around our neighborhoods. Here's what you do. It's a walk of gratitude. You're going to go out and you're going to take your walk around the neighborhood and you are going to notice everything that is beautiful. And everything that is a blessing to you, that is special. So it may be the smell of smoke from someone's chimney in the air. It may be the special bite of the air, that morning or the color of the leaves. It could be anything along the way that you find special or beautiful, and you make note of it. And take a moment to be grateful for it. And to give thanks. Quite an exercise. That's a way to make gratitude a part of certainly one walk and possibly of every day. And it is a great way to fight this sense of I am entitled to these things. I had an experience just like that this week. I, I hardly can ever muster the discipline to do this. But this week, for some reason, I managed for three days to muster the discipline to get out of a warm bed early in the morning to go for a run. I can do that during the, when it's warm outside, when, when it's cold. Oh, I just have never been good at getting out of a warm bed to go out and actually go outside into the cold. Somehow I did this one. I got up. I remember it was Tuesday. I went down the stairs, and there was still a chance of a reprieve because I made an agreement with myself that if it's in the 20s or under, I don't have to go. And if it's 30s or above, though, I can manage that. I can bundle up. I can manage that. The 20s, that sounds crazy to go out and run in the 20s. So I don't have to go. So I went downstairs with my fingers crossed, 29, on 29, and, and it was 30. I knocked on the thermostat to get it to change, and wouldn't I check the weather channel? And my, my iPhone is 30. So I 
little bit, I went out, and went out, and of course the first mile was, was miserable. It's as cold as it ever is when I run. 30 degrees, absolutely the lowest, and my feet were cold, my hands were cold. I was plodding along, and the first mile was terrible, it's always terrible, but particularly so on this cold, dark morning. Then I got just past the first mile. And suddenly I started feeling really, really good. Uh, I could still feel the cold. The cold was still there, but instead of feeling bad to me, it felt, it felt good being on that cold. It felt right. I liked the cold at that moment. My heel that normally hurts didn't hurt at all. And I was going along at a nice pace, and it felt like my feet were barely touching the ground. And, and when I had started, the sky was all black, but now, at this point, it's getting purple. It's beautiful. There's that Christmas in the air, and it's quiet except for my breathing and my footfalls on the ground, and the sound of King City Southern. I hear that off in the distance. It felt so alive. It's one of those beautiful, great moments of life. And I couldn't help but think to myself, I am so awesome. I am so great. I mean, who else would have gotten up at 5 o'clock in the morning? Who else would have braved the cold weather? Who would have done it? I deserve this. I have this great moment that I have given so much for. I have this grit to go out in the cold weather and to go on this run. Ooh, I deserve this moment. I might as well have said, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me here. And I certainly was not in any way remembering the Lord our God. And what a shame, because that could have been one of the best spiritual moments of my week. The thing is, there's some truth to what I was thinking. That there is a sliver of truth. I wouldn't have been there if I hadn't gotten up and hadn't run that first mile and I would have gotten the second mile. I did a little discipline. I did a little bit of work. Just a sliver. Because of that little sliver of bread and discipline and work, just that tiny bit, it wasn't that big. Oh, I got out of bed. Big deal. Everybody does that every day. I just did it a little bit earlier. But because of that work that I had done, I felt completely entitled to that perfect moment. And I missed it. I missed the truth of that moment. I missed the true beauty of that moment. I missed the fact that the sound of the train the briskness of the air and my own health and my own feeling good in that moment. All of these things built up into this experience and all of them individually in this experience together. All of it is a little often overlooked but actually some of the most wonderful gifts of God. Here, here's another exercise you may want to try. And I like this one when I'm in a bad mood. It seems to work really well. Because, you know, when you get in a bad mood, often you're in a bad mood. And it is because of entitlement. You feel uh, somebody's jipped me out of something. I didn't get what I should have gotten. They didn't treat me the way that I should deserve to be treated. And so you're sitting there. As we're sitting there in our bad mood, as we're stewing there, as we're thinking our negative thoughts about people, take one of those thoughts and take it and turn it from a negative thought into a thought of gratitude. A grateful thought. Let me give you an example. Again, from my week, the thought, I can't believe I just had to spend $500 on a new set of tires. How irritating that is. <coughs> Take that thought and turn it into something like, I am so grateful I have the money to pay for a new set of tires that's going to keep me and my family safe. One way to keep this sense of entitlement at bay, to help us to be 
real, real gratitude. And that's important because, you know, one of the central messages of Christianity, the Christian faith, is that we are not entitled to what we have been given <coughs> by God. We are not entitled to it. We cannot possibly earn it. We are, all of us, debtors. We are indebted to one another. We are wound together and bound together in a, a fabric of relationships. And none of us stands alone or by ourselves. We are all indebted to one another. And we are certainly indebted to God. We are indebted to God for our very existence and for all those wonderful little gifts that we don't see each day. God keeps bringing into our lives and we are indebted to God's Son for our forgiveness, for our redemption. And these are debts we can never repay, and so what is our only response? In the face of these incredible gifts, and whatever we do is so meager in response, what is our only good and proper response? It is to remember the Lord our God. And to be grateful. And to say thank you. And then we truly see, we truly appreciate all that we have in our lives. Well, here's one last gratitude exercise. It's actually something that was done by a gentleman named John Craven. John Craven's an attorney. And a few years ago, he was having a terrible year. He came up with this gratitude exercise that he was going to do. He decided, even though his law firm was in bad shape, he was, he was almost about to have a terrible, he was having a terrible relationship with his wife, his relationship with kids and with others around him wasn't what he wanted them to be. He said, it's not concentrating on all that's negative in my life. I want to concentrate on what's positive. And so he set a New Year's resolution. He said, in this coming year, I am going to write 365 thank you notes. One for every day of the year. I'm going to write these thank you notes. And he did. He started on this process. And about the third day of the year, he remembered his, his resolution. He started to do it. And immediately, he started feeling. He started recognizing important changes in his life. And as the time went on, he began to really see them and identify them. And a couple of interesting results of this, he said, was right away as he started doing this, he found that he wasn't concentrating anymore on his, himself and on all the things he didn't have and he felt he deserved and had earned. He wasn't concentrating on the negative. He was concentrating on all that he was being different. Every day he was looking for something that somebody was giving him and he was finding it. He started recognizing all that was coming into his life and all that was positive. And then he started focusing not just on what he was giving, but on those who were making that possible in his life. All those who surrounded him each and every day. He was focusing his attention on what he was being given and on the people that were making it possible. And then he noticed something else. And I believe this. Oh, I believe this. He said, he said the more he, he took Thanksgiving and put Thanksgiving and love and appreciation and gratitude out into the world, the more good things came back to him. The more good things he put out in the world, the more he felt the good things. And I think maybe more he just saw them. Yeah, maybe more good things were coming in, but I think he was recognizing more and more of them as well. But basically, he went through it, and by the end of the year, he saw that he had changed the way that he sees the world. By putting this gratitude out there, and by doing that, he had changed, also changed the way the world saw <coughs> Him. Well, I want you to think about this. Now, here, today, and all through this week ahead. Answer these questions. What is it in your life right now that inspires you? What is it that moves you? What is it that causes you to smile? 